Yes, God, we are here this morning to be able to worship you. And, and nothing else this morning, that we can be able to just get rid of everything else that's going on in our hearts and minds, that we can be able to be fully devoted to you in this time, to be able to listen to words that you have to tell us. I pray that you'll help us to clear our hearts and minds of everything but you, Lord, that we can just be filled with your presence, that whatever the, the decisions that we need to make this week, we'll be able to have you on the forefront of our minds, that we'll be able to know that we're, that we're following you, God, because you are filling us, and there's nothing else that could be guiding us, Lord. I pray that you will offer that for us, that we can be able to, to be able to feel that, that we're making the right decisions, that we are and you, it's surrounded by your will and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Why don't you go ahead and grab a seat. Welcome again. If you got here a little late, my name is Pastor Greg Hintz, and we are so glad to have you here today. Only two weeks left in our current series, the series that we're doing called Unshakable. And what we've been doing in the course of this series is just digging deep into one book of the Bible. In fact, it was a letter written to Timothy from Paul called First Timothy. And so we've just been really digging down deep and getting into that. And it's, it's been good. It's been a good journey for us as we've been able to dive into God's Word. And we've been able to look and talk about a lot of different things. And today, as we transition into a new chapter, we're going to be looking at something else. And, you know, a story that sort of came up this week about what we're talking about and sort of the journey that we're going on, it reminded me of the story of a young girl who was running late to Sunday school. She was all dressed up, and it was on her. She had to go from her house to Sunday school, and it was a long run, a run through the woods, down the street in order to get to the Sunday school. And she was late, and so she was running just as fast as she could. And as she was running, she was praying. And her prayer was simply this, Lord, don't let me be late for Sunday school. Lord, don't let me be late for Sunday school. And as she's running, she hits a rock, and she trips, and she lands face first on the ground. She's all dirty and her dress is torn. She stands up and she's wiping it down, but she knows she's going to be late, so she starts running again, except this time her prayer changed. She said, Lord, please don't let me be late for Sunday school, but you don't need to push me either. She just kept on running. You know, I say that story because maybe that's how we feel sometimes. When we're praying and God wants you to do something, but things don't exactly go the way that we planned, Sometimes our prayer is, but you don't need to push me either. What we're looking at in the course of 1 Timothy is really understanding how to build a foundation on our lives that's solid so we can become unshakable. That's the goal of what we're looking at. And we see that Paul is giving Timothy clues on how to build an unshakable life. So why don't you take your Bible if you need a Bible, you can get one from underneath the seat, and I want you to open up to the book of 1 Timothy. Open up to the book of 1 Timothy. Now, if you've been with us on this journey, we've talked about a lot of different things over the past few weeks. If you haven't been here, I'd encourage you to get online, theplaceaz.com backslash messages. You can watch the actual video of the messages that we've shared. But in the course of the last few chapters in 1 Timothy, we've been able to hear Paul speak about leadership. We've heard him speak specifically to men. We've heard him speak specifically to women. And now we're going to get into a portion of Scripture where he's going to be speaking specifically to to Timothy, the leader of this church inside of Ephesus. And so if you're in 1 Timothy, we're going to go to chapter 4, verse 12. That's where we're going to sit today on our journey. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy 4, 12 reads like this. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, I have to let you know that this was written to a church leader in a church in Ephesus. It was a city, it was a place, specifically, specifically to him. But it is as true as it was to the church in Ephesus as it is to the church in Wickenburg, Arizona. 
that what we can surmise out of this scripture and bring into our lives is as important to each and every single one of us as it was to Timothy as he was hearing those words. And those words are important. Those words were simply this, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. You know, Timothy, Timothy was a disciple who had been trained really by Paul, and Paul is writing this letter to Timothy to encourage him. Now, we don't know exactly how old Timothy was when this letter was written, but scholars say that he was somewhere between his early 20s to mid-30s. In this time, to be a church leader, this was a very young age. Can you imagine someone in their mid-20s being a, a church leader? Not just any church leader, but a church leader in a growing region, in one of the main cities in this area. I mean, he was a church leader in the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus is just this growing, growing city. It was the chief commercial city in this area. So you can imagine all the commercial things would go through the city of Ephesus. Products would go in, products would go out. Imports, exports, all these things were continuously happening. In addition to being this chief commercial center, it was also the center in this entire region and district of mother goddess worship. Remember we talked about that temple a couple of weeks ago and what was taking place inside of Ephesus. So people would travel from all over to become part of this pagan worship, to worship this mother goddess worship that was taking place. They would take, that was a main thing that was happening in this place of Ephesus. And one thing that you may have not known before this morning is that Ephesus had a population of around 300,000 people. Now you can imagine Timothy, a pastor, in a growing church, in a region that commercially is the center, you know, pagan worship is the center, and now has a population of a few hundred thousand people. He was doing a lot. He had a very vital role, and the city of Ephesus was very important to the, to the Christians that were there learning and growing in their faith. But I want to let you know that it's also an important message for you today. In Scripture, we know that Paul is speaking to Timothy and that Timothy is young and that God is using Timothy to do great things. But I want you to know today that he wants to use you to do great things too. Now, you may not be at the place where people are looking down on you because you are young and trying to do great things, right? May not be, maybe it is, maybe it's not, you know? But we're in a place where we're stepping out and we're trying to do great things, and we're like, I hear what Paul's telling Timothy, but that doesn't relate to me. We, we may think that way. But what are some things that people look down on you for that would stop you from doing what God has called you to do? For some of us, maybe it's our past. Maybe it's the things that we've done in the past, and now we're following Christ, and we're trying to live our lives for Christ, but the people that are looking to us are continually bringing back who we were, not who we are. And before we know it, we find ourselves being pulled back towards that in that direction or thinking how can I possibly stand and do this when all people see is who I was in the past and so we find this thing weighing ourselves down that those same words would be true for you today don't let people look down on you for who you once were right but look at yourself at who God has created you to be today Stop listening to the folks who are trying to tear you down and start listening to the God who has the power to enable you to do great and mighty things in this world. Amen? Who are we listening to? And, and, and that's what Paul is trying to communicate to Timothy. Quit listening to the people and start listening to me as your spiritual leader, but start listening to God and the plan that God has for your life. And that can be really intimidating. Because for some of us, it scares us to have people follow us, right? Because we look in the mirror and we're like, I am messed up, right? You know you messed up. If someone knew to reel you, not the you that everybody sees, the thoughts that you have, you're messed up. And now you're going to be saying, all right, follow me. How can we possibly do that? There's a trick and there's something that each of us have to know. If we're honest with ourselves, we would realize that we have issues. 
If we're honest with ourselves, we would realize that we're not there yet. But if we're honest with ourselves, we would realize that God is in the transformation business. And he is transforming us each and every single day. And our responsibility is not to look at all the blemishes in our life, but to stay as close as we possibly can to Jesus Christ. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is to be as close to Jesus as I can, to have a conversation regularly with him, to be actively involved in my devotional life, opening up his word, letting his word come alive on the inside of me, changing me, conforming me, making me into who he wants to be. And then in that moment, as I am trying to stay as close as I can to Jesus, I can look at people and I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. Because the closer I am to him, I can help lead others in that direction. Does that make sense? So that changes everything because it's, it says that you don't need to have everything perfect before you start reaching out to folks, but your job is you need to be as close as you possibly can to Jesus because wherever you are, that's where you're going to be taking people. And so the true test comes in your life. Are you a disciplined believer in Jesus Christ? Are you actively in God's word? Are you actively praying and seeking his face? Because in that moment, you're close to him so that when you lead others, you're leading them in the right direction. And you can make that statement, follow me as I follow Christ. And so Paul tells Timothy, don't let them look down on you because you're age. But then he follows that up, but he says, but set an example for the believers. And so he's saying, I want you to live your life in such a way that when people see you, they see Jesus. Amen? And he begins to unpack different ways that we can do that. Now remember, these words as good for the church in Wickenburg as they were the church in Ephesus, and they're as good for you as they were for Timothy when they were written thousands of years ago. So we have to look at these things and begin to apply them to our lives. Set an example to the believers. Okay, set an example to the believers. How do I do that? Paul says this, set an example to the believers in speech, in speech. The Greek word that's translated speech is the word logos, logos, where we get the name for our library. Literally, if you were to take that down, logos, where that, that's the spoken word, right? That which is coming out. It could literally be translated as words. But set an example in your life with the words that are coming out of your mouth. Now, this can go into a lot of different areas when you think about it. I mean, maybe for some of us, it's, it's, it's the words that come out. Are, are we putting out words that are building up? Or are we putting out words that are tearing down? Are we putting out words to destroy? Are we putting out words that are helping people become better? The words out of our mouth make a serious effect and difference in this world. And so we have to pay attention. How are the words coming out of our mouth? What is coming out of our mouth? Is it edifying towards Christ or not? That's a decision that we have to make. You know, for some of us, it's, it may not be uh, how we speak to others, but maybe the things we say about ourselves. You know, for some of us, maybe we like to stretch the truth a little bit or maybe lie just a little bit. I love Jesus' advice about this in Matthew 5.37. He said, all you need to say is simply yes or no. He said, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I love that. Just let your yes be yes and let your no be no. And you're like, okay, oh yeah, that's so easy, right? I mean, it's not easy all the time because sometimes it's difficult, right? Like this guy, like he comes up to me and he's talking about his new haircut. And he's like, hey man, what you think of my new haircut? Now, I want to say you look like an electrocuted rooster. I mean, I really, really do, you know? But what will I probably say? Oh, that's a hip new style. That, you can pull that off well. It looks good on you. No, it doesn't, but I don't want to tell him the truth, right? It's easier in that moment to lie. I remember I used to sell real estate. And selling real estate is difficult sometimes because sometimes you're encouraged to stretch that truth, right, just a little bit. I remember, you know, you go into a house and you see a house that was totally destroyed by, by a dog and you're just like, oh man, and how am I going to write this up, you know? And before you know it, you're sitting down and you write, excellent house for pets, you know? And, and you just stretch that just a little bit, you know? Or, 
you know, in my area where I'm from, you know, you see a house that was all shot up, you know, an old crack house or something, and you'd write down high traffic area, and uh, it would be true at many different levels, you know what I mean? Uh, you would stretch that truth a little bit. Well, in our lives, we really need to find the place where we're able to talk to people and say truth to them. But here's the key, because some of you are so far on the truth side, you're just offensive, uh, that we have to find a way to balance grace and truth. In other words, you can say truth to someone, but you can pepper that truth with grace, respecting them, respecting sort of where they're at, but never, never stopping from saying the truth. In fact, sometimes in a conversation, if I know that I'm going to have to say something difficult, something hard, I'll actually tell them ahead of time, do you really want to know the truth? Do you really want to know what I think about that? Even if it's not going to agree with you, do you really want me to be honest with you? And if they say yes, then they've given me the permission to speak that forward. And also, I operate with a principle that has helped me many, many times in my life. I call it the checkbook principle. And what that means is like in everybody's life around me, anyone I have influence with, I'm consistently putting deposits in their life with the time that I spend with them, if I care for them, praying for them. You know, all these things I'm depositing into their life. When you have to say something difficult to someone, that's a withdrawal, okay? And what happens a lot of times, especially if you're a leader, you make a withdrawal out of someone's life that you haven't deposited into, so what's going to happen? You're going to bounce your check, okay? And that relationship, a lot of times, is going to be broken. And so in my life, I'm consistently, I want to make more deposits then I have to make withdrawals. And so if I have someone that sometimes I have to speak serious truth to, I'm going to make extra deposits in their life because I love them enough that I know there's going to come a day when I'm going to have to say a tough truth to them and I want to be able to take that withdrawal. That makes sense? That's good in your life. It's good with your relationship with your spouse. You know, sometimes we want to take withdrawals, but we haven't put in the deposits. We have to put in the deposits. It's good at your work, your coworkers, if you're a boss, your employees, every different area. So pay close attention to that. Watch what comes out of your mouth. Set an example with that. Next one we have is set an example for the believers in conduct. In conduct. Uh, this word is actually a Greek word that is used 13 times in the New Testament. The Apostle Peter used it eight times in First and Second Peter. Now, this idea of conduct is our actions, how we act. It's interesting Peter would use this more than any other biblical author, that he would use this actions word over and over again. Almost like he understands, looking back at his life, there's some actions that had affecting, affected him profoundly. Well, for me, when I read 1 Peter 1, 14, 15, and 16, it made perfect sense when I read this, set an example with my conduct. Peter said this. He said, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. That word is that word used, conduct, in all that you do, for it is written, be holy because I am holy. So we're called in our lives, our actions are called to change, to reflect God, be holy as I am holy, be holy in all that you do. He's speaking to believers, he's speaking to you, and he's speaking to me. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. We're new creations. We've been transformed. Our lives should look different. Someone should be able to look at me today and say, you're not the same guy that you were 20 years ago. And I'm not because God has changed me and is changing me. You know, the number one complaint with non-Christians when they look at the church and when they look at believers is simply this. They say, they're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. You guys must have heard that before. They're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. And I've had in my life that I've had seasons where I've lived a life of duplicity. When I was living the life of a hypocrite. In that season of my life, it's interesting because even though I was a Christian, I wanted to keep that a secret. I didn't want people to know that I was a follower of Jesus because my conduct 
didn't line up with my words. What I was doing didn't line up with what I was saying. So I didn't want to bring Jesus into the way that I was living. Listen, maybe that's where you are today. I want you to know that you're not alone and that God is in the process of changing you. But in order for you to be changed, in order for me to be changed, I had to reach the place in my life when there was total and full surrender. He wanted me to give everything over to him. He wants you to surrender the mask that you often wear when you're out with your friends and just be real and honest about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I got to tell you, when you start living without the mask, when you start representing Christ everywhere you are, you're going to feel convicted sometimes. There's going to be a conviction in your heart. There's going to be like, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing this or this or that, you know. You know, I wish I wasn't talking about Jesus right now and because there's this conviction. But let me let you guys know that there, there is conviction is a beautiful thing because it's the Holy Spirit directing your life. And I got to tell you, whenever I'm outside of the will of God or I'm over in an area that I'm not, and I get a conviction from the Holy Spirit, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Because you know what that tells me? He still loves me. He still cares for me. He's still directing me. He hasn't given up on me, that he's still leading me in the right direction. And so I want to encourage you in your life, no matter where you are, just represent Jesus. Always stand for him. That moment that you say, oh, I don't want that person to know that I'm a Christian, I want you to ask yourself, how's my conduct right now? What's the reason why I don't want them to know that I'm a Christian? I go out of my way sometimes to be in difficult situations and to represent Jesus. And what I find is in those difficult places, that's where Jesus moves the greatest. That's where he moves. If you'll open your mouth and you'll represent him, don't live a life of duplicity. One of the scariest verses in all the Bible, in my opinion, is Mark 8, 38. It says this, Jesus' words... He said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. I never want to be in a place where I'm ever ashamed of my Lord and Savior, and I never want him to ever be ashamed of me. And so I reach a place in my life where I always want to represent Christ in every situation that I find myself in. Let's do one more. Uh, the next one is this. But set an example for the believers in conduct in love. In love, this is a word talked a lot about love. You know, this is the word, the actual Greek word here is a word that you guys probably heard before. It's the word agape or agape, some say, agape love. It's, it's an awesome kind of love. It's a love that is given even though you don't deserve it. It's the, the word found in the most famous verse in the New Testament. Anyone know the most famous verse? John 316, that's right, it's the verse everyone memorizes first, John 316, for God so loved the world, for God so agape the world, that's the word used there, for God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son. So we see it. this is this giving kind of love, this is the kind of love that we're called to set an example by having this kind of love. There was a song that came out in the 70s that it talked about this love and it talked about a unity. Some of you guys may have heard it before. It, the lyrics go like this. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they will know we are Christians by our love. You know, a great great tune and even something that we see from scripture that's really important if you've never heard that song we actually posted it up this morning on our facebook page facebook.com backslash the place az they have a modern version done by jars of clay uh who who did this song you can get on there check that out like our, like the church it's just a great way to communicate uh but when i first started they will know we are christians by our love and, and what, I, what I saw with that is the, the love that we have for one another. And I think that that's really, really important that there is this, this evident love that we have between one another. But sometimes I think it's harder when we begin to love those that aren't like us. And we begin to love those who don't think the same way that we think. And, you know, this week I had a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience because I was able to to have my first ever daughter 
<laughs> there's another photo of her, Juliana. Juliana came into my life, and, and I remember, like, picking up Juliana and just, just holding her and just praising God and thanking her. And then as I was doing that, you know, I have, I have friends that are continually reaching out, reaching out to moms that have babies or they're pregnant and they think that they want to end that pregnancy. And my friends are reaching out, showing them this love. And I remember holding her in this realization that here I see the greatest gift in the world is this child that I have. But for many, they have that same gift, but they don't see it as a gift. They see it as a curse. And here, these people that I know, these friends that I have are reaching out. And what they're doing is they're simply saying, I understand this thing called love. And I understand this thing called love is an action. It's something that they do. And so they actually reach out. They reach out in front of abortion clinics. They reach out to moms that are going in. And they let moms know, listen, there's another plan for that child. They let them know, we will take your child in. We will care for your child. We will give you everything that you need to get a head start in life. So far, I think that they've saved 17 children just by standing out right here in downtown Phoenix, reaching out to moms that are going in. But we realize now this is difficult kind of love. This is hard kind of love. This is a love that is more like work, where you have to get out and actually do that. What's interesting for me, because as I've sort of gone down this, this journey of thought and even preparing for the message today, I really came up with the overwhelming reality is that, you know, this is just a, one more example of a story. It's a story in my life. It's a story in their life. And even it's a story in a life of someone that many of you may even know, too. It's a story that I've actually captured on video for you right here. Here, check this out. I was pregnant and alone. I lost my parents during my teen years. My sister had moved to the other side of the country and my fiance had disappeared three months ago. I'd been waiting, hoping he'd come back after getting cold feet about the wedding and fatherhood. We met while we were students, with dreams that one day we could afford more than our small incomes would allow. Now our dream world was going up in smoke. Dr. Levin explained there were three choices open to me. One, I'm 18 weeks along and could still terminate the pregnancy. Two, I could carry the child and give it away for adoption. Or three, I could go it alone, have the child and raise it myself. After quite a bit of discussion, crying and some searching, I realized I wasn't emotionally set to raise the child myself alone with no family. Torn up and crying, I made an appointment with Planned Parenthood. This wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I refused to be destroyed by this unwanted child. I also set up an appointment with an adoption agency, in case I changed my mind. And for some reason, in the midst of all that was going on, three little words kept haunting me. What's God's will? After my initial appointment with Planned Parenthood, where I scheduled the termination, I came home and noticed my bottle of prenatal vitamins sitting on the counter, reminding me that I forgot to take them that day. I laughed at the irony and was just about to throw the bottle away, but gave in to my convictions to take one more, just in case. That's when my best friend Vicki showed up. She drove me to a Christian pregnancy center and then afterwards dragged me to hear some new author speak at the small house church. The author's name was Hal Lindsey, and when he spoke, I felt like every word he spoke was meant directly for me. And when he looked at me, I could have sworn I saw flames coming from his eyes. I can never forget when he looked at me and said, no matter what your sin is, God loves you and will forgive you. Afterwards, Hal Lindsay prayed with me to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And I decided to keep my baby, even if I had to raise the child alone. After three more months, my fiancé returned and we got married. Not in the happily ever after sense, but we had three more children together and I made sure they were raised in the church, even if I had to go it alone. And my oldest, 
the one I almost terminated. I could hardly keep him away from church. He became a pastor. Still, at times I wonder what would have happened if my friend Vicky didn't drag me to church that night. What's God's will? One story, one person, one life that was changed. One life that was changed by a Christian who had love and grace and the courage to reach out with that love and that grace. That person, that could be you. All of us are here and, you know, we know Pastor Adrian and we've grown to love him and we're learning about his family and so much more. You guys have just learned a little bit more about him and one person that reached out to his mom. And it's funny, as we talked about his story, how Lindsay was speaking in Little House Church, he said probably there were like 20 people there. He may have left and not even known about the impact of one prayer with one person and how it's impacting generations. I want to encourage you as the church today to be that one voice to one person to change this world. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Will you bow your heads with me? God, I thank you so much for our stories. I thank you so much, Lord, for seeing your hand in our life, Lord. Even when we can't do it ourselves, Lord, that you are working on our behalf. Why? Because you have a plan and a purpose for each and every single one of us. Today, Lord, we want to be inspired to be your hands and to be your feet, to shine you bright to this nation and this world, to let others know that there is a plan for their life, that there is a purpose, and that purpose is Jesus Christ and that he came to live, to die, and he rose again for them, to show them a perfect love. And Father, I pray for each and every single person here today, Lord. Let them walk with you in this perfect love. Let them shine that love, Lord, to, to those that are easy to show the love to and those that are difficult, Father, but just let them be continuously shining your perfect love to this world. And as we do, as we show that love, we know that many lives will be touched and impacted for generations. We pray that in Jesus' name. And everyone says, Amen.